And I must say that I have two disadvantages, uh, unlike many of the colleagues that I've seen up here. Uh, one, that I'm a lawyer. And uh, I've probably heard every lawyer joke in the world and unfortunately agree with most of them. So um, you have to have a little patience with me. Uh, the second disadvantage is uh, Hans uh, invited me here this week to give you some insight into uh, law and drinking water legislation, especially following Walkerton. And I must say that um, after hearing so many of the presentations uh, that I learned so much. So in effect, I may be taking away more insight uh, than I can give you. So I apologize in advance for you. And the best I can do is share the thoughts I do have and hope that there's uh, something you can take away from it. Uh, but I do, uh, and I'm humbled by some of the presentations and some of the insights and uh, some of the aspirations I've heard over the last few days. And certainly I'll go back uh, recharged, re-energized uh, on the fight for clean water from what I've heard. What I'd like to do is um, talk a little about, um, about three things. One is, you heard earlier during the week the presentation from Bruce Davidson on Walkerton. Uh, my group was the uh, group that represented him at the inquiry. So what I thought would be appropriate is that we give some follow-up in Ontario of what happened legally in terms of legislation in Walkerton. Uh, and that's what you see there. Uh, then I'd like to talk about the gaps and where we go. And that's what I'd like to talk about in terms of outstanding issues. And the third thing I'd like to follow up on then is where's the federal government in all of this, and particularly First Nations. So uh, although I gave a um, extensive slide presentation in your binder, I don't propose to go through each one of them. In fact, we'd like to go through them uh, fairly quickly. Uh, if there is detail that you would like to read more so, you have it before you. If you've got a few minutes in the future, you can refer to it. I think at this point, I'd like to stand back more and talk more about what it means generally and where we want to go more specifically rather than the details of legislation. Um, uh, not that legislation isn't sometimes interesting, uh, but that's not the point. The point is, uh, what lessons can we learn from it all? Before I do get into Walkerton situation, though, I do want to let's let you know uh, my perspective. Uh, I'm the director of the Canadian Environmental Law Association. We're a legal aid clinic, which means we're a non-governmental group, and we have a, a two-fold mandate. One is to uh, represent in courts and tribunals low-income people in disadvantaged communities. So we work with low-income people throughout Ontario, including many First Nations, um, dealing with problems of contamination, uh, water contamination, uh, pesticide problems, uh, leaking landfills, uh, health problems, etc. So that's what we do. We are a public interest law firm, uh, most of the time um, in the courts and tribunals, uh, trying to protect uh, vulnerable communities. So if I sound a little jaded or uh, a little frustrated, you'll know because when you represent vulnerable communities all the time, you see that the odds are often stacked against you. Uh, the second thing that we do is that we look at law reform as a way to overcome problems. So we try to change the laws both federally and provincially. And therefore, I cannot give you many of the answers that you may want in terms of how do we fix our communities? How do we energize uh, uh, people that have been so uh, hard done by? How do we convince politicians to do the right thing? I don't have the answer. Um, but as a lawyer, I do believe that there is a role for law. I do believe that if the laws are in place, it gives us a basis upon which to argue, a basis upon which to show uh, what needs to be done, and in many situations, a basis upon which to sue, to enforce our legal rights. And Elder Cardinal mentioned, do we have to bring lawsuits sometimes? Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, we do have to fight out in courts and hammer out those kind of very unfortunate instances. Our clinic does it a lot. Uh, in many ways, we're unapologetic about it, because unless politicians 
get beat over the head at times with lawsuits, nothing changes. So that's what we do and often not popular for it. Uh, but I do believe that law has that problem or that role. The problem is, is that there's often a disconnect. Law is nothing more and ought to be nothing more than a reflection of values in society. But I believe there is a disconnect. I believe that the values of the Canadian society in terms of looking after the vulnerable, looking after our resources, protecting children, is way ahead, more progressive. People are thinking more about it and want far more of this kind of protection than what the laws suggest. And the politicians have not recognized that we, the people, want more than they're giving us in terms of legal protections, in terms of resources, in terms of capacity to protect present and future generations. So part of what we need to show is that gap between what they're doing and what we want. And I think role, uh, law does have a, um, uh, a role to play, and often it's, it's difficult to show that. Now, I want to start off with um, the Walkerton situation, and uh, for two reasons. One, I, a point I want to make about why Walkerton, and then second, what was the aftermath of Walkerton in terms of law? And again, I don't want to give a legal lecture, I just want to show what's going on in Ontario has a model of some things that happened. Now, in terms of Walkerton itself, I know that uh, Bruce Davidson did an excellent job of outlining what actually happened physically, and I won't repeat all of that. Uh, basically, it was a, a situation where a uh, runoff um, uh, ran into a well. Uh, the well was used for drinking water, and uh, some people died, some 23 people, 100 got ill. Um, Emanating from that was an inquiry. And that's where we represent concerned Walkerton citizens, uh, a local group. And I want to say something just about that local group as an example, because you heard Bruce talk. We, we were retained by the group very soon after. And when we arrived in the community, what we saw was a very distressed community. I mean, we're from Toronto, we went to the small community, and we had no idea, despite the media, how impactful this tragedy was on every person in that community. It was a community under dire, dire stress, and you cannot imagine how awful. Some people dead, virtually everyone either sick or related to a sick person. So when we met these people for the first time, literally around a kitchen table, we really didn't know what to expect they wanted of us, and we didn't know what they wanted from the future in terms of the legal system. We were surprised because what they said is, what we're surprised is not what they wanted, but what they didn't want. They didn't want retribution. They didn't want money. They didn't want all that uh, remediation at first glance. What they said to us was, can you help us make sure that this does not happen to another community? And that, I must admit, fundamentally changed and uh, gave me an enormous insight into the depth and character of that community. That the first thing they thought of was prevention, rather than all the things I would have thought of if my children were in that situation. So I knew we'd be off to a good relationship and something special would happen. So. Uh, the Canadian Remedy Law Association did work with the group at the inquiry. And the inquiry had two parts to it. And I want to make sure you understand that because of what I'll say. The first part is what happened. What happened was the first part of what the inquiry wanted to find out. And there's two questions. What physically happened in terms of how the contaminants get in the water? But was there something in terms of political policies or processes and practices that contributed to the tragedy. That was part of the inquiry question. The second part of the inquiry was how do you improve water quality generally, uh, drinking water quality generally in the province outside of the tragedy? So we know how the, um, uh, the, the uh, physical causes, but what was mentioned earlier today, and one of the points I wanted to make uh, very clearly is that the tragedy at Walkerton was more than 
two incompetent water managers. We know the water managers were not trained. We know that they didn't record uh, water contamination levels. We know they didn't do the right thing. But we also know that this was a system breakdown. It was a system breakdown from the very approval of the well to the inspection and monitoring of the well to the uh, oversight of the training of the water managers to the funding of the water managers to the oversight of the reporting of water results to the enforcement of all of this and to the funding of the enforcement infrastructure. Um, at every, and I go through it in quite a bit of detail through the slides of the failures. Justice O'Connor, who's the Court of Appeal judge that oversaw the inquiry, found, and one must remember that not only did three or four cabinet ministers appear at the public inquiry, the premier himself was cross-examined at the inquiry. So this was the only second time, I believe, in the history of Ontario where the premier, well, a premier, had to testify. And all through the, the uh, inquiry, their view was that it was two water managers that was to blame. But the inquiry found that that wasn't correct. It was water managers that were not trained properly, and there was all kind of uh, problems they precipitated, but it was also a system meltdown itself, that there wasn't a framework of precaution, a framework of inspection, a framework of enforcement, a, fr a capacity to respond to the problems which would, in retrospect now, clearly evident far beyond and before the inquiry, uh, before the tragedy. That's what Justice O'Connor found. So this, to me, is a, in itself a watershed that finally people like you and I are vindicated by saying our leaders, our politicians, our legal frameworks are failing us. So uh, I would urge you to look at that inquiry report if you ever need some solace, some reinforcement when you get tired. Because after a year and a half inquiry and one of the most reputable judges in Canada says the same thing, essentially what you and I are saying. And I go through <clears throat> in great detail again of what he found. And I, I won't uh, go into detail today except the recommendations. And what Justice O'Connor recommended was something that we've heard about in the last few days and what perhaps now is almost what, what, what you'd expect. And that you need a multi-barrier approach to water protection. We need to protect the sources of drink, drinking water and we also need uh, efficient and optimized treatment and distribution systems and of course adequate uh, infrastructure to ensure that if one barrier breaks, if something happens in the, in the process of treating water, something else will capture it. And of course this is what was found uh, in the British Columbia's Drinking Water Review Panel and uh, North Batterford recommendations. Now I want to talk about what was the legislative outcomes of this, but I want to juxtapose one comment. I quick, quick, quickly went through one of the slides of the history of the Canadian Environmental Law Association, and I don't want to say this in an arrogant way, but in 1980, we started a campaign in Ontario calling for a Safe Drinking Water Act. And many of my colleagues still at the association remember the campaign very well. And for over 11 years, we've been, I was personally been arguing for a safe drinking water in Ontario. And we put legislative models forward. We convinced uh, politicians to put private members bills forward. We lobbied, we argued, we pleaded. You'll see now that two years after the walk-in inquiry, we have a Safe Drinking Water Act in Ontario. What's the lesson? The inevitable lesson, the unfortunate lesson, the tragic lesson, is that people had to die before politicians would create the act. That is a crummy way to make public policy, to say the very, very least. But that's the outcome. That's the inevitable conclusion that one, I, that one could learn. Let's hope I'm wrong. Let's hope that there was other factors that led to this conclusion. But I just want to make very clear to you that the campaign for clean water in Ontario 
was two decades old before t Walkerton. So um, many of the outcomes are not new in terms of innovation. Many of these things have been talked about for decades, and none of them are ne ne not necessarily innovative. But the solace of it all is that they're now coming into place. We now have that framework we didn't have. And in, to a huge part, it's because of the community in Walkerton, as I mentioned at the start of my talk, that said, our job here is to ensure this never happens again. So in many ways, the pieces of legislation here is a tribute to the Walkerton community. So once again, when you feel tired, and you feel that none of your words or actions make any difference, please have some confidence that I know that's what people in Walkerton felt too. But now they have their legacy. Now, what is the legacy like? Well, um, the Safe Drinking Water Act um, was passed, was the first part passed, and it really deals with, um, a tr and, and, and again, I won't go through the details, uh, <clears throat> but it basically converts many of the voluntary and guideline approach that was before the tragedy into mandatory issues. So drinking water, uh, <coughs> excuse me, di drinking water uh, guidelines are now standards. There is clear rules around licensing water treatment plants. There's clear rules around training. Training regulations came into the province in the early 90s, but many of the operators were grandfathered or were subsumed into the regime, even though they didn't have to take any courses, including the operators in Walkerton. That's now, uh, by law, mandated that you must take the courses. The labs must be now accredited. And I just want to give you one insight in here. One of the contributing factors in Walkerton is that in 1996, uh, the province of Ontario changed the rules in terms of water testing. Up into 1996, the Ministry of Health, public labs, tested most of the municipal water facilities, in, uh, particularly uh, medium and small towns. When those water tests went to the Ministry of Health, um, the Ministry of Health, of course, would re report adverse water results directly to the town, directly to the Ministry of the Environment, and directly to the local public health authority. The Ontario Drinking Water Objective said that that's what you should do. In 1996, um, budget cuts forced the uh, government, or not forced them, the budget cuts dictated that the public labs were closed. So towns like Walkerton then had to contract out the testing of their water. They contracted out to a small firm that never tested water for microbiological criteria before. It was a lab that focused on chemicals. So in May of 2000, which was the date of the tragedy, was the first month that in fact they tested for this kind of stuff. When they found it, their view was that they only had to report to the water manager. Even though the Ontario Drinking Water Guidelines suggest or stated they must report it to the Ministry of the Environment, they must report it to the local med uh, medical officer of health, they only report it to the water quality manager under the view that they're under contract. It's proprietary information. So the manager knew about this for days while the Walkerton town was looking for what's causing the illness he had the piece of paper in his hand, we think. And there's some dispute about that, but nevertheless, we knew the lab did not communicate that to anything but the water quality manager. So that's what happens when deregulation and budget cuts happen without some thought. And as evidence came out in the inquiry, is that the Minister of Health wrote the Environment Minister in 1996, 1997, says, if you cut pub uh, public labs, there will be confusion about who reports to whom you must create a regulation. And that was done three years before the tragedy. So uh, that goes to the fact that, that the Drinking Water Safety Ground Act attempts to overcome all of those issues by legislating requiring uh, those reporting relationships. Uh, accreditation of labs, 
accreditation of training, uh, water quality standards, advisory committees on the standards, etc. So that's one barrier that was done, and it took about a year and a half to two years to enact the regulations. Um, is it a good act? It's pretty good, um, and it's it's uh, it's pretty focused in terms that the Minister of the Environment, I think, is spending a fair amount of time looking at it. The second um, issue was nutrient management. And the Nutrient Management Act um, was conceived before the tragedy, but was really a fast track after it. And this requires uh, certain requirements of farms in terms of um, farm management plan, manure management plans, nutrient management plans, um, on how to treat it. And this is, again, the goal was to prevent the migration uh, of contaminants into drinking water. Um, unfortunately, as you'll see, um, only large farms were covered under the initial regulations, and the smaller farms and the full weight of the law will not um, actually occur until 2008. And that's been a very controversial issue in Ontario. The third or another barrier is what we call source protection, and this is what's in the works now, and I'll just describe it quickly, but it is fascinating. One of the things that the government refused initially to do after the Safe Drinking Water Act and after nutrient management was to protect the sources of drinking water. So many of us work pretty hard in trying to convince the government that it takes more than treatment to protect drinking water. You must protect the water that's in the ground and on the surface before you even put it into any system. So um, in the fall of uh, 2002, a committee was struck that reported in April of 2003. And then um, uh, we now have draft legislation called source protection legislation. And I will uh, uh, briefly tell you how it, we think it's going to work. The province will be divided into 36 watersheds and their physical watersheds, the Grand River watershed, the uh, Credit Valley watershed, uh, the Long Point uh, watershed. Each of these watersheds will have a plan that assesses and, and determines where the sources of drinking water are and then creates, in effect, a regime to protect those sources. The important part uh, of that is, and this goes through the criteria, um, it gives us a basis upon which to understand what are the threats and stresses for those sources of drinking water, and then it gives some sense of how to overt or overtly deal with those stresses and protect them. The important thing about the plan is that once the plan is in place, no, uh, our goal is that no land use planning decision can override the plan. So you can't put a factory or zone something within the plan that's inconsistent with the goals and structure of that source protection or watershed protection plan. So you can imagine it's not greeted totally with a lot of friendliness by certain developers, et cetera, because what we're saying is, is that source of drinking water from a land use perspective, from an environmental perspective, is going to have precedence. It's going to take priority over other uses. That's the goal. The other uh, aspect of it is that we want the plan to be inclusive and particip participatory. In other words, those that are affected and are part of that watershed will be at the table we're arguing for to protect the water. And uh, as I move on, you'll see that one of the things that we've been arguing strenuously for is to ensure that the First Nations are at the table, that they're part, intimately part of the watershed planning process, and that they have the capacity to be at the table. Um, and again, the, uh, the slides I have create a lot more detail about this stuff, uh, which I will leave with you. At the end of the day, it's the Ministry of the Environment that will approve the plan based on certain criteria. Whether or not this will work and whether or not it will get past legislation, we don't know. But at least there will be a plan in place based on the watershed to protect the sources of water. That's the intent. And again, it's, it's a, it's a ground-up plan. It's not created by the ministry and approved by the ministry. It's created by the people on the ground that work together, hopefully, 
that have resources to work together, hopefully, and, um, um, and then it's, it's passed through the legislative process. Um, one of the proposals we have is that in Ontario there is a, a permit system where if you want to take more than 50,000 litres of water from the ground, and talking um, more so about uh, factories, industry, and water bottlers, uh, right now there is no charge for that. And there's a moratorium on water taking because we found in some areas there's more water allocated to water bottlers and to factories and industry than there's water in the ground. So our proposal is that there's a charge for that water. That charge or that fee will then be created a fund that can be used to protect sources of drinking water. So uh, that will hopefully be part of this legislation. Um, I just want to reiterate that we've been trying to be incredibly sensitive to the fact that those affected by drinking water, those that are, has been disadvantaged by poor drinking water, uh, and those that are closest to the source as First Nations ought to be full participants, ought to be at the table um, in a meaningful way. And we've been working with a number of, of uh, First Nations on how to do that. I want to um, <clears throat> get into then what's missing from this regime. We've talked about Nutrient Management, Safe Drinking Water Act, Source Protection. Um, I, I want to give you so the positive side, but there's also things which I think are problems still. One of the insights I've learned throughout um, the last few days is that water is more than just a resource. It has a spiritual value, it has a, a fundamental human need value, and, and it's something that is an absolute requirement for us to survive. Anything that important certainly must be deemed more than a commodity. Certainly it must be seen that we as individuals, as we part of the uh, watersheds ourselves, have some access to that. Nowhere in the legislation, though, is there any right to clean drinking water? Is there any recognition of the special social and spiritual value of drinking water? So uh, in, our, in our view, uh, this is one of the absences both in Ontario and at the federal realm, is that drinking water and access to it has no special status. And my view is that it is a inherent human right and it ought to be recognized like that both federally by way of a constitutional amendment or some other piece of special constitution and certainly within provincial jurisdiction. So you'll hear me talk about this in the future because to me it's, it's, it's just obvious. It ought to be unlike um, other jurisdictions that have it. The other thing that's missing from Ontario legislation, of course, in, in many sense, federal, is that um, where the weaknesses are is still, despite everything we've heard and done and, and tried for, is the community right to know, which is access to vital information. If you look at a lot of the US models, um, both federal and state, one of the mechanisms they have is the readily access by individuals to look at the results of your drinking water almost um, simultaneously becomes available. In other words, that in some areas you can literally look at the website to look at the results of your drinking water. In our view, it's fundamentally important that every resident has access to the quality, to the information, the data on the quality of their drinking water. This is something we didn't win in terms of the legislative fight. So in our view, unless we create transparency of information and access to information on what the quality of the water is in real time, then we'll never get the truth. There will always be excuses, there will always be uh, people hiding behind the absence of information. We've got models of where this is done. It's not a technological issue. It's not an issue of, 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 of anything other than simply political will. So that's another absence. And <clears throat> one of the other real challenges in Ontario, and I'm sure across Canada, is how do we ensure 
the quality of drinking water for small drinking water systems as we do for bigger systems. Uh, Justice O'Connor at the Walker Inquiry um, was lobbied and uh, many people suggested that maybe it's best that there's two tiers, one for big municipalities and one for small. And uh, if you go through the report, uh, Justice O'Connor was very, very clear that everyone has the equal right to safe drinking water, whether you live in small communities or big communities, whether you live in rich communities or poor communities, that that is a non-negotiable. And it's up to government to find means and ways to ensure the viability and the safety of drinking water. It is not where we want two-tier systems, one for the haves and one for the have-nots. And uh, from our clinic perspective, it's always been a challenge because we've seen small communities come to our office and say, it's going to cost X amount of money to, impo to, to meet these new regulations. How can we do it without going bankrupt? Um, and I have great empathy for that. And we've been trying to figure out funding mechanisms and working with municipalities to figure out how best to do it. Because on one hand, we want them to have safe drinking water. On the other hand, we don't want them bankrupt. Um, and of course, the problem with many small communities, inherently, they, don't have, they do not have the finances to do it. Uh, Justice O'Connor was also very clear and recognized unequivocally the challenge uh, First Nations has with drinking water. And he went through in a chapter, uh, a special chapter on the challenges facing First Nations. And again, uh, we're, we're trying to follow up uh, in the legislative process of how to address many of this in a way in terms of, of talking to First Nations and seeing what help we can give them. And he, again, these are just more recommendations that he went through focusing on Ontario First Nations and, and how he thought that some of his recommendations could help them. And uh, again, they're all listed um, in, in, my, um, in, in, in the notes in your binder. The reason I jumped right to this slide was this is that, let's face it, um, there is a tremendous deficit across the country, just not in Ontario, in terms of drinking water. It's nowhere better felt than within First Nations. And the question I pose virtually every day is, if we all know there's a deficit, there's a, there's a crisis going on within First Nations for drinking water, where is the federal government? Where is their fiduciary duty their special duty to protect all Canadians and to protect those which are being harmed. Um, certainly, drinking water is a classic example where groups like ours, and I know so many of you, have reminded them of their duty to work with and for all Canadians on this issue. And right now, uh, clearly their role on drinking water has been quite limited both within First Nations context and outside of it. Often they blame the Constitution in the sense that it gives them such a limited role. And we know that that's just an excuse. That is why that we proposed that what we need is a, some sort of legal right based either on the Constitution or some other uh, national way that gives each and every one of us access to clean, drinkable water. Uh, as uh, mentioned the other night by Jack Layton, a bill was introduced about three years ago that wouldn't have gone this far, but would have gone pretty far in creating that legal hook, that legal basis for the government to do it. And the reason I'm so insistent on it is twofold. One is if they have the legal obligation to do it, it's much easier to get money to exercise that legal right. And second, if they don't exercise that legal right, groups like ours and other groups across Canada can hold their feet to the fire in courts and tribunals across the country. And I know, again, that's not the best way to make public policy. The best way to make public policy is to sit around the table and work it out. But nevertheless, in, I know many of you have tried that, and I know the frustration. So maybe there has to be another way. But anyways, my vision is a Safe Drinking Water Act that ensures the government or guarantees some access by Canadians to that water. It will help better coordinate 
uh, drinking water standards. So there's at least a floor, a basis, common basis, so that people in small communities get just as good water as those in large communities. That people in vulnerable communities and poor communities are not disadvantaged, not disproportionately affected like so many, um, like, like it is now. And third is that um, it seems to me that really what we need is a federal government that's willing to take the leadership role in investing in small communities and drinking water systems. In my mind, um, it is a federal government that has the resources to invest in infrastructure, in piping, in new technologies. Canada should be the leader in new technologies, in water technologies. We should have uh, and be bragging about what we've done in small communities. We should be boasting about our technological innovation. Instead, we're hiding from it. All the things I've outlined in this presentation um, are well within federal jurisdiction. I, I would challenge any federal official to say that they do not have jurisdiction or constitutional authority to do it. The question is not a legal issue at this point, it's simply political will. And one of the other issues was the development of more comprehensive and strict drinking water guidelines and standards for across the country. What I want to conclude with is simply this, and I'll make it just three points. Uh, first and foremost is I brought up Walkerton not to show whether Ontario is going in the right direction or not. I brought up Walkerton to, in a way, lament the way public policy and drinking water has happened in, in Canada. That has to, something bad has to happen. I think in the last two or three days you've heard in this room something bad is happening. There are many slow Walkertons in Canada. And uh, I think we need to continue to work together to convince politicians that that crisis is already happening to spark the kind of activity that we now see in Ontario. <coughs> the second is that the failure of what's going on now cannot be blamed on any one community or any one individual. We really do have a, a gap between what people want and what governments are willing to do. In my view, there's a broad consensus within Canadian society that there needs for action in small communities and particularly First Nations. The third and last message is this, is do not get discouraged. Do not get discouraged. The stories I've heard and the people I've met and the triumphs I've heard in the last few days gives anyone, I think, the hope that we can overcome these problems. When I look, uh, talk to or, or listen to uh, Tom Goldtooth, to uh, Paulette Tremblay, these are the heroes of this generation. These are the people that will, are the revolutionaries that will change the legal framework. It's our duty, I think, to help them in any way we can and help your uh, people like that in your community. And if there's anything that we can do at our clinic, we'll try our best to give you that kind of support and assistance. Thank you very much.